Moving forward. When thinking about the mobility as a whole, it's impossible not to think about the politics of mobility. I think we live in an age where um, when, how and where we move are as important as where we live in terms of differentiating one person from another. Indeed, we can think about mobility in terms of a hierarchy with a, a kinetic elite at the top who can move from place to place with relative ease, who travel quite frequently, who generally travel comfortably um, over great distances um, and are welcomed uh, wherever they arrive. And on the other hand, the kinetic underclass who are sometimes forced to move when they don't want to and other times prevented from moving when they do want to. And their travel can be uncomfortable, highly regulated um, uh, and, and, and less a matter of choice than, than, than it is if they're a member of the kinetic elite. So what I want to do is, is differentiate this um, hierarchy, this politics of mobility, using six ideas, six things which are central to any form of movement. I'm not suggesting these are the only ones, but they're certainly six important ones. And the first of these is the why, th why things or why people start moving. What is the motive force? If, if we think of physics, then for something to start moving, there has to be a force of some kind applied to it. With humans, uh, that force can be external, someone making us move, something making us move, or it can be internal, it's a decision, something that we do. And I think that it's very important to think about the, the, rel the degree to which any human movement is based on uh, desire, willpower, and intention and, or, or, on the other hand, is about um, compulsion, something that is forced, something that is, has to happen or, or there will be negative consequences. And these, I think, uh, make mobilities very different. They differentiate them in interesting ways. I think it's, it would be easy to, to suggest the kinetic elite always choose and the kinetic underclass don't choose. I don't want to say that. I think even the wealthiest business traveller must sometimes despair as they, as they check into their first class seat on a plane to fly from Paris to Singapore. Even though to someone else that might seem like luxury to them if they have to do it all the time and it's part of their job, they may feel obligated. So I'm not suggesting an easy distinction, but I do think nevertheless there's, there are important differences between the person who may be tired and may not want to fly to Singapore and the person who, for instance, feels like they have to climb into the wheel well of an aeroplane in Africa in order to get to London and, and ends up falling out frozen, dead, uh, somewhere outside Heathrow, um, which happens regularly. Uh, in, around the world, people trying to get from one country to another by, by, by hiding in the wheel wells of aircraft. The second facet of mobility that has a politics is velocity, speed. In some ways this is obvious, if you can get somewhere quicker, uh, usually that's because you've paid more money or because you have access in a way that someone else doesn't have. We can think of um, uh, you know, the fast lane in some kinds of road systems now where people pay extra in order to be in the fast lane and not the slow lane. We can think of um, uh, in airports where, although um, since the age of Concord, uh, you can't really fly anywhere quicker than anyone else, all classes fly at the same speed, the bits at the beginning and end, how quickly it takes you to get through the airports are speeded up uh, for those high up. Uh, and even if you do have to stop, then you can stop in a business lounge rather than in uh, McDonald's. So there's a, there's a key um, difference there in terms of speed. Um, but it isn't just a matter of going faster. Uh, another aspect of the politics of velocity is slowness. So we know, we know there's a slow food movement, uh, the movement out of Italy called Cheetah Slow, which is uh, the slow city movement. Um, there's a slow culture movement. And these are also bourgeois. Right? The, the, slow, the slow food movement doesn't come out of the working classes. The, the slow food movement is, a, is only from those who are able to think about slowness as something good, right? who are able to make the choice to be slow. So we can see how speed and choice interact here.
in interesting ways. One of the most extreme forms in which we can think about velocity is the idea of immediacy. Uh, something happening at exactly the same time as something else. And it is something that the philosopher Paul Virilio has written a lot about. Paul Virilio has argued that um, one of the big transformations that's happening in history is that we're moving into an age of the immediate, where things happen at the press of a button. And this isn't to do with transport technology, this is to do with uh, communications and to do with um, uh, the ways in which we're all wired in, in various ways. The third aspect of the politics of mobility is rhythm. Now, rhythm refers to either um, intervals of mobility, where one kind of mobility happens uh, in, in particular um, sets of time repeatedly over and over again, or it can refer to a relationship between mobility and immobility, where stopping and starting happens uh, sort of uh, with a particular measure, like in music, at a particular kind of interval. Rhythm is something that uh, has been considered in a number of different aspects. So one of the ways we can think about it is, is in the 19th century, in the origins of train travel, where the rhythm of life was transformed by the fact that timetables had to be adhered to. Before that, um, usually people could wait, but the train isn't going to wait because you're late. A train is going to depart, or at least theoretically, a train will depart on time, and if you miss it, you miss it. So the rhythm of people's lives started to get connected into the train and into the time frame of the time structure with train travel necessitated. So the way that we talk about time now, watch time, you know, the time we have on our watches is, is a time that its origins are in trains and the way that they had to construct timetables so that trains wouldn't crash into each other. Uh, uh, and and so, so rith the rhythm of life was completely changed by that um, dual uh, invention of, 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 that, of, of the railway and railway time, or the time that we now know. There are other kinds of rhythms um, that we can think about. Uh, the French urban theorist Henri Lefebvre uh, talked about two kinds of rhythm. One he called organic, which is the rhythm of the body, something that is, that, that is close to, you know, he romanticised it slightly with this idea of a kind of natural rhythm. And the other is imposed. It's a, it's a technological rhythm. It's the rhythm imposed by things like the railway and, 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 and new forms of time. So one way you can think about rhythm is, is a conflict that emerged in this period between the rhythm of the body, the natural rhythm, and the rhythm that's being imposed uh, by, by capital, by capitalism, by technology, by industrialization and urbanization, all of them happening through the 19th century at, at a massive pace. So Henri Lefebvre put it like this, rhythm appears as regulated time governed by rational laws, but in contact with what is least rational in human being, the lived, the carnal, the body. So the body has a rhythm, uh, rationality has a rhythm, and they come into contact. And in that contact, there's a kind of politics. We can see, we can see this as well as in, in trains, we can see it in a number of different aspects of life. So one of the things that happened in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century was the way in which factories became regulated in terms of clocking in, clocking out, uh, having lunch breaks at particular times. Um, we can see more recent aspects of, um, of uh, rhythm in terms of uh, what, what's called gait analysis, which is uh, gait as in G-A-I-T, which means like walking, right? So now it's possible, I, I understand, to, um, un to recognize somebody, to identify them by the pattern of their walking. So that um, uh, fr from a distance with a camera, you can see someone's walk and recognize who they are. And these are being used in airports and other places to, to recognize people from a distance. Not, you don't need to have a fingerprint and a contact. You can see just by their movements, um, their rhythms, whether they're suspicious or, or whether they're trusted. So there are suspicious kinds of rhythms, trusted kinds of rhythms. And on a larger scale, you can also see that in airports. People have looked at when, where do people travel and when do they travel? Are they traveling on one-way tickets? Are they traveling to strange places? And these become part of, the, of what's put into programs to recognize passengers so that when you get to check-in, they know whether you can be trusted or not trusted. And that also is part of rhythm. The fourth aspect of a politics of mobility is the route that mobility takes. Mobility doesn't happen uh, evenly, like water spilled across a, a table with no uh, friction. Mobility happens by being channeled, right? 
like a stream, like hydraulics. So you, you, tr you channel it in a particular way. And a lot of the politics of mobility comes through the way in which not mobility is stopped or started, but just where it's allowed to go and where it's not allowed to go. Uh, it produces currents, it produces correct designed flows of mobility. And this obviously happens in transport planning. Um, uh, roads that are, that are designed or, or train lines that are designed in order to move people in particular ways and not in other ways. Increasingly, this is political because um, uh, this channeling can occur in ways that, that privilege certain kinds of movement over others. So particularly the movement between, say, an airport and downtown in a major city like Paris or London, uh, you will usually get a fast route that takes you from airport into the middle of the city. Um, ignoring everything around it. Usually there's not even, uh, it doesn't even, the train doesn't even stop. You can get the Heathrow Express. The train just takes 15 minutes, doesn't stop anywhere. Stephen Graham, the urban theorist, calls this the tunneling effect. Uh, and this happens in all kinds of ways. Whenever, you, whenever people pay for the privilege to move, it often means that they can move faster and more directly from one point to another. And when you're not paying, it becomes more convoluted. Um, one of the th examples I came across um, working in Los Angeles was um, they were trying to design a light rail system to go from the suburbs into the centre of Los Angeles. And various um, organisations protested against this, saying this all this was doing was, was benefiting uh, a disproportionately white population that were working, lived in the suburbs of Los Angeles and coming into their jobs, whereas the people that cleaned their houses uh, often Latino or Korean, often female, had to rely on the buses, which often had four or five connections to make in order to get from, you know, in the opposite direction, in a, in a, in a, from, one, from a different place, the inner city where they lived, uh, to the houses in the suburbs of these people who had moved downtown for their jobs. Uh, so the houses could be cleaned while they were working. So one, one mobility is made easy, the other is made difficult through the routing and the connections that have to be made. So we can see how conduits or channels or tunnels uh, are also a political issue um, that's, um, that, that, that breaks through a kind of old idea of topography, the shape of space, the shape of the landscape, and produces a new kind of politics based on what we could call topology, which is not about whether one thing is next to something else, but whether it's connected to it. The fifth aspect of a politics of mobility I'd like to talk about is, is how it feels. This isn't, doesn't seem quite the same because you couldn't think about this in a physical sense, but as long as it's humans we're talking about, or possibly animals we're talking about, uh, how it's experienced is very important. We've already touched upon uh, aeroplane travel, uh, how it feels to be traveling first class as to how it feels to be traveling uh, economy class, or what I sometimes call cattle class. Uh, is, is very different. In one, you're, you're, you might be massaged, you might get fine food made by a well-known chef somewhere in the world or designed by them. And again, you get, you know, you can lie down 180 degrees, you can, all of these experiences. Well, if you're at the back of the plane, it's a very different um, issue. Also, we could consider walking, uh, the opposite extreme from plane travel. Many of us might consider this a pleasure, something we'll do after dinner go for a nice walk, uh, go for maybe a walking holiday in the countryside, in which case walking is, is, this, uh, is a privileged activity, whereas walk, and it's experienced as that. Whereas um, if you are walking because you have to, it's a very different um, experience. One thing I came across recently was uh, a, um, a looking for houses in, in the United States. You come across um, a little thing called the walk score. So you can, you can look at a house and it tells you, is it walkable? i.e. can you get to the local urban amenities, can you get to a library, can you get to shops, do you have to get in your car or don't you? And the idea of this walk score is it's a good thing. You know, if you've got a walk score of 80%, then you, it's a good house. And um, I recall looking at um, a, chat, a chat room about, these, about houses, buying a house in Boston, and um, one uh, person said, well, where, where is a good place in Boston for walking? Uh, you know, I, I, I want a good, good walkability in my, in my neighbourhood. And someone else replied, and I thought this was totally brilliant, said, if you want to, a neighbourhood where lots of people walk, just live where poor people live. Because where poor people live, they have to walk. Uh, the, the provision of infrastructure isn't as good. Uh, they are less likely to have a car. Um, they're just used to it. The sixth aspect of the politics of mobility is when and why does it stop? We can think about this as friction. 
uh, mobility it never occurs in a frictionless world. There's no such thing as a, a perpetual motion machine. Uh, there's always uh, it always encounters something that makes it stop. The question is 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 why and how, and clearly friction is unevenly distributed, and for some people there's more friction in their lives than for other people. So we can think about the various forms of security that exist in urban environments: CCTV cameras, gated communities, the various kinds of spaces that you can access or not access. Uh, even at a shopping mall, you can go into a shopping mall, and if you are, you know, a respectable-looking person, so you fit somebody's expectations of what a shopper looks like. You would never know that you, there was anyone watching you. You would never know that um, that it was possible to be stopped. But if you don't fit into that, it's quite possible you could enter this space, and and security would appear. Security that's invisible to those to those people who. Um, you know, don't need to be concerned with it. But to other people, maybe young people with skateboards or wearing hoodies, maybe people who aren't uh, looking, looking affluent um, uh, will, will be stopped. Friction will occur. This happens also at airports, of course. Uh, the people that are stopped most frequently uh, um, uh, are, are people who don't fit a category of a trusted traveller. Uh, whereas a person that does fit a trusted traveller in Europe, that would be a middle-aged, white, male, a business person, for instance, who travels frequently in recognised patterns, flows easily through this, whereas you are stopped frequently if, uh, for various reasons, you don't fit that model. Um, geographers used to talk about something called the friction of distance, which has simply meant that the further something away from you was, uh, the more likely it was that um, uh, it, you wouldn't interact with it. In other words, the closer something was, the more likely you would interact with it. This, in a globalised world, has ceased to be always in true, and often not true. Um, uh, uh, Indian populations in Southall in London are much more in touch with India, for instance, than they might be with, say, West Wales. Uh, even though West Wales is obviously a lot closer because of the way communications work and the way telecommunications work in particular. But um, we, we are entering a time when um, borders and boundaries are the things that, that stop motion aren't really distance, but much more about the particular kinds of spaces we're moving through and who we are. And the distribution of friction is something that's very political. What, who stops, how often, and again we can talk about you know, people being stopped while they're driving, who stopped while they're driving and why, walking through the city, who stopped and why, and who can just move easily and not be stopped, or, and only stop when they choose to stop. Uh, these are also important questions for the politics of mobility. So I've talked about six facets of the politics of mobility, six things that need to be considered when considering the way in which mobility is wrapped up in power. At the starting point, that is why movement starts, speed, how fast or slow do we choose or not choose to travel, rhythm, uh, what intervals do we travel in, uh, how are we using, following a rhythm we want to tr follow or a rhythm that's being posed upon us, routes, how do we get from A to B? Is it, is it an easy route or a difficult route? Experience, how does it feel to travel? Uh, how pampered are we or how, um, how uncomfortable is it for other people? And, and, and how we stop when friction is encountered and how that friction is distributed amongst different groups of the population and different individuals. Each of them is important in the creation of, a, of a, the mobile world we live in, and each of them is contested, and each of them are relevant to any form of mobility we choose to look at, from walking to driving to flying. Uh, there may be others, I'm sure there are others, but these six, I think, are things that need to be considered.